Okay, today we're talking about women in our families and researching them. I've uh, learned a lot in the past researching my own family and cemetery walks. And uh, the main thing that sticks out to me is how hard it is to be a domestic goddess with dirt floors, no running water or electricity. Our um, ancestors were incredibly resourceful. They lived in an era before government support and they had amazing survival skills. They were resourceful, compassionate, and we should tell their stories. So first thing you need to do is what I call the name game. So you have to figure out every name your lady could be known as. Um, so before she's married, all the various ways that in a document, in a newspaper, um, Effie or Effie could be known. And you have to account for your spelling and variations. And then of course, when she marries, or she gets a whole new set of names. So if she's just had the one husband, by the end of her life, she could have been known by 17 possible names, plus all the confusion of other people having similar names and similar initials and all the spelling mishaps that can go in there. So once you've sorted all that out and looked at every possible place you can think of to find information, it's then a case of putting that information together. So assuming she only has the one husband, you need her birth, marriage and death certificate, working backwards through any other marriages, etc. You need the death certificate for any husbands. Make a timeline, um, look for any possible errors and admissions. If she has one, more than one marriage, at a minimum, you would need six certificates to identify her lifeline being the fact that uh, each husband, his death would list his children. So there you might find he's had a previous wife. Um, the same for her, she could have had um, children before she was married. So you need all those certificates to verify all that information. So once you've sorted all that out, it's then a case of fleshing out the story. Um, this wonderful photograph is a wedding down in Bunyip at the Bunyip River Sawmill in 1911. I love it because it clearly shows all the family and it even has the minister um, perched up on top of some sort of sawmill equipment. And obviously the sawmill um, was where some of these people lived. So they've held the wedding in the building, which I think is absolutely fascinating, especially if you'd found that amongst family um, memorabilia. So what sort of things are you looking for? Well, you want books, all sorts of books, letters and diaries, all this information is going to help you get an idea of your lady. So if you find examples of her handwriting, you'll get an idea of maybe what her literacy skills were, what her education was. You get an understanding of what was important to her. Um, the women tended to be the ones who corresponded with other members of the family. So they would send off a letter and it might have in it um, a newspaper cutting that's um, something that's happened in their life. They might have been um, winning an award for their cake at the local fete or their cow got an award at the local show. All those things um, are important to establishing what sort of life your lady had. The other thing you have to remember is all families have grain of truth in the stories that have been handed down. Um, it's just how big is that grain of truth? And some of those grains have been liberally dosed with sugar to make them more palatable, but doesn't necessarily mean they're right or they're wrong. It just adds to the character of the family that you're looking in. So if you have letters and diaries and handwritten things, take the time to transcribe them. It's time consuming, but it will help you pick up names and events that you may have just glossed over when you quickly read a document. You went, oh yes, I know about that. And you've put it to the side. The other thing for transcribing these beautiful old documents is 
The younger people today can't read the cursive handwriting of the previous generation. So at least if you can type it out and identify everything, um, you can pass it on. You need to also look in things like the family cookbooks. Quite often the recipe would have been handed on from another family member or it's been um, cut out of something and it's got a note written on it about, do we all do that? We've got a piece of paper and just write a note on it, stick it in somewhere. So things like a cookery book have a lot of information about a family. Also things like autograph books uh, or address books and birthday books, they've all got potential gems on your family and your lady and it helps you work out relationships. So if a school friend wrote in her autograph book, that school friend may turn out to be the mystery witness at her wedding. Um, a change in an address book could be the fact of why somebody's missing from the family when they have a baby, they've gone to visit a relative. So if you've got access to those books, it's, it's a valuable way of, of getting more information about the family and the woman. And they sent off so many things to one another. Quite often in the early 1900s, late 1800s, they just sent an email, a, a postcard like this one. It just says, I've not been well, I'll write you a letter later. But they've sent that little note off. And that might be the only time where you um, have that information because you might not have the letter. So those things are really good to look at. Now, when a woman married, um, she took her husband's name. And up until the 1960s, it was normal for her to be addressed as this lady, Mrs. Philip B. Makoski. Before her marriage, she was Miss Josephine Fletcher. So that is relevant to your research because when you're researching for her, you might put in Josephine, but um, in any document, she's only known as Mrs. Philip B. Um, and that was perfectly normal in that time frame. Um, the other thing is that if you look in the 19th century, the marriage laws in Australia and England maintained the common law edict that when the woman married, she lost her legal identity unless there was a separate settlement. Um, any property or money that she bought to the union passed to her husband. She couldn't make a will or enter into a contract or sue. She could not give evidence in a court of law, but she could be put on trial and sentenced to death and imprisoned. Her present, um, her personal life was completely under the control of her husband. She had no legal share to her children and he could take them from her. And if he died, he could appoint someone else as their legal guardian. And in Australia, the first Married Women's Property Act was in New South Wales in March, 1879. And that first act here in Australia progressively freed women of these old constraints. But women in that time frame did own property. Um, usually they would be a widow or an independent single lady who had property who'd been bequeathed to them, or they'd earned the money them and bought the property themselves. So don't discount that when you're researching. Now, divorce and desertion have to be looked at relevant to the time frame. It was almost impossible for a woman to get a divorce in Australia prior to the 1870s. And up until 1881, a man could sue on the grounds of adultery alone, but a woman had to provide reasons of cruelty and desertion as well. It was very expensive. It'd be reported in the newspapers, which would shame the woman and her family. And most reports in the newspaper of divorce is a husband leaving the wife and children. But there were occasions when the women also left. Um, this first one here, white versus white, um, they have five children and uh, he's suing her because she's left to go and live with um, someone who used to be one of their boarders. The Beckman divorce, this is a, a woman um, and she handed the children over to him saying it was the man's duty to look after the child. So um, she was out of there. Um, and the other one, the Viscount, as obviously there was a lot in the newspaper because that was any, you know, social pages that um, she was divorcing her husband and that she had four children and, and it gave when she was married and her maiden name. 
and where she was from. So those divorce records give you information into the family background that you may not have already discovered. Another divorce that um, I came across when I was researching for our cemetery walk was Donald Bain from the Berwick area. Um, he married in 1910 and he served in World War I and when he returned, as it was for a number of the soldiers, um, they had a difficult relationship because they'd been estranged from their family for so long. The war had affected people in both the man and the woman. And uh, she applied for divorce on the grounds of constructive desertion, meaning that he was no longer friendly to her. And he countered with his um, claim of desertion and it went to the um, Chief Justice. It was in all the newspapers. It was highly um, slanderless for the era, the things that were reported. And the Chief Justice decided at the end of numerous backwards and forwards that he wouldn't grant them a divorce. So they then lived apart for the rest of their lives and um, he raised his only child. So those sort of things you don't ex necessarily expect to find. You just think, oh, they're divorced, that's it. But sometimes in the newspapers and um, in the records, you can find very interesting information about a family situation. So then uh, women did leave wills. Um, especially if they had been widowed or if they were single ladies, they would leave a will. Um, you can find out from the notices um, information about where they're living. This Olive Alice was living um, at Rydalmere, but form formerly lived in um, Harbord in New South Wales. It's basic information gives you when she died and uh, things to follow up about her, other places to look. Um, the single ladies would often um, leave large bequests um, to organisations and friends. Uh, all those things you can find um, online these days. You've also got death notices, which can enlarge the story for your lady, particularly if it's a rural um, or outer urban area, the newspapers were more likely to feature a woman's obituary. Um, the one here um, with Mrs. Corbett, this one was a newspaper article that had her photograph um, and told us that she was the ex-president of the Australian Women's Association and um, that the board of the association had also sent their sympathy and condolences and it gives her husband's name. Um, and it was a quite a long article with a lot of background on her um, involvement with the community. Um, the man's um, obituary here on the side, um, it tells us that his daughter had recently come from England back to Australia to visit her mother. Doesn't give you her mother's name. She's referred to as Mrs. Churnside all the way through it, but does tell you that Mrs. Churnside had been injured in a motor accident. So it gives you an avenue to go and look at. Um, tells you a bit about Mr. Churnside and it gives you information about his daughter's married name and the fact that um, she's been living in England. And it was another long article with predominantly the man's um, background, but lots and bits and pieces about his family. And a man's obituary would often include the married names of daughters and uh, quite often where they were if they were interstate or overseas. So that helps you put, put more together of, of about that person. So then you've got all the various public records that you can find that have got women in them. So citizenship and naturalisation records, um, you'll find those at the um, our national archives. Um, more to do with people that are obviously not of English background um, because we were by default English because of the time frame, but. There were people who came from France to Australia and married here. Um, if they wanted to have land in their own right, they had to have citizenship for it. Um, and this is back at the turn of the century, not not so obviously more so in modern days with, with all the um, refugees coming from other countries. But 
that's where you're going to go and find paperwork on these ladies. Um, if you're looking at things like the English census records, uh, take a note of what date that census was taken on and what the questions were, because each time the census was done in the UK, they added new questions in or slightly changed the question. So if you're following the census through, um, sometimes it can give you clues to um, where they're gone, um, what's happening in their life, um, putting them into a place and a time parameter. Um, the electoral rolls in Australia, you have to be aware of when could the women get the vote? Um, you could get married at 16 in Australia, but you couldn't vote until 21. So you would quite often sort of think, well, I know she's married. Why can't I find her on the electoral roll? Well, she wasn't 21, so she couldn't vote. Then there's countless other public records that you can look at um, in person or online. Um, all the almanacs and trade street and phone directories will give you a guide to if that woman had um, a business. She may have um, been a midwife. Now, midwives advertise quite extensively. Um, and midwives was one of those rare roles for women where they could continue their business as such after they were married. Unlike nurses and school teachers, the minute they got married, that was it. They had to stop. Um, midwives didn't have that sort of restriction on them because they were fundamentally independent um, workers. They weren't working for an organisation as such. So that's handy to remember. And if they're in a government document, you have to remember that the government was collecting information about people that came under their jurisdiction. Um, so if they worked for the government in some role and were being paid by the government, there'll be some sort of paper trail for them. Um, those government records aren't normally indexed under an individual name, but they're in indexed under occupations. So if you're looking for somebody who was working in a post office, you would go and look at um, the government postal where, where job applications and job promotions and job transfers, those sort of things. And you'll find quite a few women listed there. A lot of the organisations, the archives, etc., have um, guides for family history. You should read those guides before you start researching. It'll give you an idea of what's in that particular document. Um, it's no good going, spending hours and hours looking at education records, looking for your school teacher, and you find out later that the records you're looking at, the time frame starts after she had finished or finished before she starts teaching. So reading that um, leaflet or guide for that government organisation is always a good thing before you actually start. It can save you a lot of time. Now, convicts are well documented, documented and um, more I'm interested in the people who were in the community, not so much as convicts. So inquests and crime, those sort of records, you do find a lot of women in them. Um, inquests, this letter here is, the handwritten note that um, Emily left to her husband, she thought she'd given him the wrong medication. And rather sadly, she's written in here that she would rather meet her God than go to the madhouse. Now that, if that was your family, that might be the only piece of recognition of her that you find, which has got her handwriting in it. You may not have any photos of her or anything like that, but that would be a fabulous keepsake even though a sad one, it will also lead you into why she's died and the circumstances and it gives you more information when you read the rest of the inquest. So when a person dies, don't assume that there hasn't been an inquest, go and have a look, just randomly put names in and see what comes up. The um, Minnie uh, and her aliases, she had six different aliases. Her crimes were fundamentally what you would call due to her poverty. Um, she was jailed quite a few times for 
being drunk and disorderly in the street. She was charged with being abusive. Um, she just had a hard life and she just kept changing her name to cover these things up. So finding her photograph, it, it would be a bonus from your family research. Um, oh. Education. So girls were educated um, to varying degrees and there's lots of places to look for school and education records. Um, you've got school registers, you've got punishment and enrollment books, a published school history which might include photographs or lists of students, um, there's yearbooks for schools, there's correspondence for schools, um, which includes lists of families and the children and their names and agents. There's truancy records. Um, private schools produce books to celebrate their 100 years, which have a lot of rec records in them that are helpful for finding your women who won awards, who were the school captains, what sports teams did those girls play on. Um, once again, you need to put it in the time frame. Um, and relevant to the family and the woman that you're researching. Many working class girls only had a very basic education. If they were the eldest in the family, they quite often um, stayed at home uh, to help with the housework and raise younger children. They entered the workforce at a younger age and they had basic ability to read and write. Before the 1880s, middle-class girls would be educated by a governess or a tutor. And in later years, um, they would go to private ladies' schools. And these private schools gave the women a, a basic elementary education, but also taught them the finer accomplishments of how to play the piano and sing, how to do nice paintings, and of course, their fine needlework. But women also attended technical schools. They went to business schools. Um, business schools were established in the 1880s, and you can find women in those schools as the students and as the teachers. You can also find women attending university from the very early ages of your universities. Um, you just need to go to the relevant university website and um, put in a uh, search alumni list and you find the ladies there. Not many as they started off, but they are definitely there. And of course, if you're searching through your family bits and pieces, you may come across something like this certificate of a um, school girls certificate for mothercraft. Um, and that adds into the lady's life. Social welfare, we tend to think of um, what's available today, but the Invalid and Old Age Pension Act in Australia came in in 1908. Um, it was 10 shillings um, payment and 10 shillings really isn't that much money. Uh, men were 65 and women at 60. And back then it was income and asset tested. You had to have been a resident in Australia for 20 years and be able to prove it. And it had other restrictions on it, which were in today's world, a bit sort of not, not correct. Um, a maternity allowance began in 1912. It was a one-off cash payment to the mother. Um, child endowment came in in 1941, which was fundamentally to help with the education of children. The widow's pension um, started in 1942, and that included women who'd been deserted, who'd been divorced, their husband was in jail or in a mental hospital. Um, and you can find information for them. The people who lost husbands or fathers um, or sons during the war of World War I and World War II, there were pensions for them, but they had to um, fulfill certain requirements to get those pensions. Um, and they were administered by the Veterans Affairs Department of the day, so didn't come under the widow's pension. So one of the uh, terrible stories that I came across researching during World War I soldiers is Clara Sargent. Um, her husband died some time after he returned from the war. They were in financial difficulties with the amount they owed for their war service home and the land they were leasing, etc. 
and the file for uh, her application for a war widow's pension is 103 pages long. It goes into all the details of um, everybody trying to help her. The local RSL here had raised £73 and they were giving her £3 a week to look after herself and 11 children. The eldest was um, 18 and the youngest was only six months old. Um, the local women had rallied around and given her a cow and they were helping her. But 103 pages of information and letters and people trying to help her finished up with the authorities of the day deemed that her husband's death was not related to his war service, even though he'd been hospitalised a number of times with influenza, he'd been gassed. And he, when he returned from Australia, he was deemed incapacitated because of the time frame that had passed. Um, he was deemed to have not died of his war injuries. And it was before the days of a widow's pension that didn't come in until 1942. And uh, Clara married in, remarried in 1941. And you would suspect that that was um, because she literally needed somebody to help raise her children. It was interesting in here that um, the uh, younger children were going to come before the police magistrate and would come under the child welfare department um, was a, a sort of charity to help raise those children. And I guess that would have happened to a number of women um, post World War One. So one of the fabulous things that the, came out of World War I was the better farming train. Now, when the soldiers returned from the war, there was 12,000 men who applied for soldier settlement farms, and they were spread all over Victoria. And it was estimated that only 20% of those men had any prior farming knowledge. So the better farming train was the idea that they would take um, information, talks, demonstrations out into the community to help these men. And by default, they also helped the women. There was one carriage initially on the train um, de devoted to the ladies. And you remember there would be a lot of men who've come out um, from the war and bought an English war bride with them. And those women would have been quite isolated in a new world, uh, in a new community, maybe on a farm a long way from anybody else. So something like the farm train would have been an absolute bonus for them. Now the farm train eventually was 18 carriages long and the last three carriages were devoted to the ladies. And it started in um, October, 1924. And the first stop was at Bunyip. It did um, 38 trips. Uh, the last one was in November 1935. It visited over 390 towns and helped an estimated 250,000 men and women with information pertaining to farming, but also children's health and women's health. Now, one of the people who were on the train for the whole of that period is Sister Muriel Peck or Peak. Uh, she went on every single trip and she was an amazing woman who was incredibly focused on making women's and children's health a priority. So this photograph here, um, this is a cot, this white box down the bottom. It was designed by um, Sister Peck and it was called um, the perfect uh, child cot. It was safe, it was fly free. Now flies were an issue in the fact that they carried disease. One thing that the train did, they had fly screens on the doors and on the windows to emphasize how important it was to keep flies out of the home. Um, they had classes in the train. Um, this is a class for expected mothers where 
it, they may not have had another woman around to help them. It was giving them information on how to care for the baby, how to bath the baby, how to feed the baby, um, an emphasis on breastfeeding, um, that substitute feeding, how to keep the milk clean, how to keep your utensils clean. All those things were being spoken of. Um, the women came in their droves. Um, they had to have extended sessions. They, of course, brought their children with them because they wouldn't necessarily have had someone to leave the children with. And you can imagine them there in their good clothes and all excited to be hearing and learning about ways of helping their lives. Um, one of the main emphases was on the, as I said, the importance of keeping flies out of your home. Flies were the major carrier of uh, typhoid. And um, in 1889, that was uh, supposedly at that time, the worst year in Victoria for typhoid outbreaks. And there was the story of the Miles family at Turidan, where Mary and four of her children all died within the space of four months of this illness. So there were many lectures about the importance of cleanliness and sanitation and the diseases that they were trying to um, give assistance about was diphtheria and scarlet fever, whooping cough and measles. The death toll in the 1910s and 1920s was one in 30 children would die of one of those diseases. So it was a, a way of getting the public and the women focused on cleanliness, um, the importance of safe rainwater collection, practical ways to repurpose things like making a um, cooler out of kerosene tins to keep milk cool. All those things were spoken of in the classes and must have been a wonderful bonus for all those women to, to have someone to go to and other people to talk with because a lot of them would have been in quite isolated farming communities and they traveled long distances to get to this to this train for its one day stop. Now there's other places to look for women, religious orders and church groups, you've got Country Women's Association, etc. All those places have got websites and there's information available. So things like um, our religious orders, the Anglican, the Baptist and the Presbyterian churches all had women's associations. Uh, the Catholic Church with their um, well-known charity uh, dispensing it out through their benevolent societies, ragged schools and female refuges. They ran hospitals um, and orphanages. The industrial and, ref and reformatory schools um, were all places where the volunteers or committee women that just the general women in the community would band together through their church or through an organization to assist predominantly other women because it was women um, having the babies, it was women who had the problems of caring for their children, it was the women who were being deserted and suffering with domestic violence, etc. So these church groups were an important part of the society um, and tracking down the nuns, um, you can find a reference here. This one is from a New Zealand newspaper. It's giving you the her maiden name, that she's from Greta in, in Australia, that she was 16 when she left Australia and gives a biography on her in that newspaper article. So you can track them down. You can find um, archives for these churches and groups. Um, you can find out information about what they dealt with and what they didn't deal with. Um, it was all part of making a woman's life better. Um, if you're looking in newspapers, um, the Catholic newspaper in Victoria was The Advocate. There was the Hebrew Standard and the Methodist Sydney and Protestant Standard. They're all on trove. Um, and they're a good inf information in general, not just for specific women, but about women's work and their charity of helping others. And things like um, 
the founding hospital in Beaconsfield was the turn of the century when what we know it today as a Berry Street, when it was first founded as a founding hospital and refuge for women. In 1914, they act op operated a home in Beaconsfield. And um, apart from giving work to young women as nurses specifically to look after children, there was a number of the mothers came out to Beaconsfield as well. And the local community banded around. They did fundraising. Um, they helped out wherever they could. So it was, again, it was women helping women um, in the community. The Country Women's Association, well, they did much more than just make scones. Um, the Country Women's Association looked after um, things like uh, toys for children at Christmas who didn't have who, you know, in poor circumstances. They also ran um, holiday homes and had um, a place down at Rosebud and later at Dramana where people could have a holiday. So this report here is telling us that Mr. and Mrs. Dean have a dairy farm at Cranbourne and they have previously spent a holiday at Rosebud for an ad a neighbour is milking their 20 cows while they have a holiday with their young son and daughter in the fresh air at the sea. So just little things like that enlarge the story of, of what the Country Women's Association were doing. They were active in advocating all sorts of things to governments and local councils to better women and children. Um, Yes, they did a lot of fundraising, making scones, but that's more a recent thing. All the different country women's associations in each state, you can find books on their history, which will have photographs about women who were presidents. It will have photographs of events. They conducted classes and lectures, um, and they did a lot of charity work, particularly around the war years, um, to help women who were left without a male support. And in, then in the newspapers, you can find photographs of these women. And you tend to sort of think, oh, well, they're all going to be ladies who've got plenty of time on their hand. No, they were just farmers' wives and um, ordinary women in the community. Um, Miss, Miss Tweedle um, was from Clyde. Um, over here we have uh, at Lang Lang, Mrs. Morton obviously had to bring her daughter Helen with her for the photograph because she uh, wouldn't have had anybody to mind Helen who's not old enough to go to school. So the local newspapers and uh, particularly the Weekly Times in Victoria have some fabulous photographs of groups of people, um, especially you know, the Country Women's Association. Other places that women were doing community work and fundraising was from the very early days of schools. The women would band together in, later they became known as a mother's club, but they would band together to help with work in the school. Um, they would eventually become the women who ran the school canteens. They were the women who did the fundraising, who organised the school fates. Um, and they were the mums of the kids in the school, and in some cases, the grandmothers. Baby health centres, when they first started, there was a lot of fundraising to um, get equipment to help pay for accommodation for the sister allocated to that particular baby health centre. There is a huge amount of information out there about the history of health, baby health centres, um, the people who were instrumental in getting the government funding, um, how they um, had disagreements between one particular group who were advocating a particular type of care for women and babies and another group. And eventually they all merged together and um, became the health baby health centres that we know today. And there's a lot of information about them. And of course, in times of trouble, we think of the Salvation Army and the Australian Red Cross. Again, volunteer women um, who had houses to run and farms they were working on. Uh, the Salvation Army had been around for a long time, um, not just involved with the war years, but involved in um, floods and fires, the same with the Australian Red Cross. Those women all worked 
hard to make the life of a um, community easier for the women. Um, and there's websites for them and there's books on their history and all those things are, are easy to access today. But then the woman at home was house proud. Now, even in the most basic of house, if they had windows, they would put curtains on them. Um, they would clean them. They were constantly working to keep their house neat and tidy. Um, when they had time, they planted flowers. And you think, why would they plant flowers when they've got all this to do? It was a little bit of joy and pleasure in their home. Um, this house here at um, Harker Way I'm, uh, is 1910, a photo coming from the State Library. Um, it's got two chimneys and you go, well, there's progress. It's got a open fire in the lounge room for warmth and it's also got the fire for, at the side for the kitchen and it's got a metal um, water tank. So 1910, there's a house which is still very basic compared to today's standards, but it's got those improvements in it to help make your life a bit better as the woman who did all the housework. Um, this house, I'm guessing, is in an area subject to flooding. When you look at how high up the steps are, um, that's quite unusual. Uh, it's a very simple house, probably only two rooms. It's got a brick chimney, so um, that would be a bonus compared to some of the others. And here they are posing out the front and uh, proudly standing in front of their home. Um, those sort of photographs, if you've got them in your family, you know, they, the women and the men were proud of what they did. You know, they had made a home and most of the time with their own bare hands. Transportation. Now in today's world, there'd be no way you'd be in a car with children without a seat belt or let your child go riding a bike without a bike helmet. But back then, this is um, the 19, just in the 1900s, um, a horse-drawn carriage and we've got four children and mum and dad in there. That's not the safest of way when you're going along dirt roads and up and down hills, but that was their fundamental means of transport or you walked, you went by Shanks Pony as it was known. And then with the advent of horsepower, um, here's a couple who are taking their children somewhere. Um, I can't imagine what it was like to be chuffing along in a sidecar with your baby on your knee, a child sitting on the floor um, and your hat on. So obviously you weren't traveling very fast, but um, it probably wasn't the safest of ways of transport, but it was quicker than walking. So one thing you should look at is when you've got your family and you found where you live, get out a map and find out where the places are that they would go to. Where is the local church? Where are their local shops? How far were they traveling? Could they get there by walking? Did they have to use some form of transport? How often would they be able to travel to the market? Going to the market was a weekly or monthly occurrence where the ladies would get dressed up in their good clothes to go to market because they were meeting other women. It was a very social event for them. But of course, going away from the house or the farm was a bonus. You got to meet other people. But when it was harvest time, it was all hands on deck. Here we have a lady. Um, she is obviously um, forking the crop up on top to this cart. That's an older child. And the two younger children are there because they can't be left anywhere else while her husband is actually harvesting. And obviously the same thing happened with um, an orchard or a market garden. The women at harvest time would go out and they would be helping. Um, and then of course, they would spend hours at, at, if it was um, a crop from their farm that they were going to use for themselves, they'd have to spend hours bottling and preserving and making jams and pickles and sauces. And many of these jars would be put aside for the church fate um, or a school fate, or they'd be taken to a um, show to um, put in a competition. And they bake biscuits and cakes and scones on um, fire, fires and in very basic ovens. And they shared their recipes and handed those recipes on. 
And it was all part and parcel of their day-to-day -day lives and hard work all year round. If it was hot, 40 degree day, you would still be cooking over an open fire. It, it would have been horrendous. And they also had all their outdoor chores that they did around the home. Lots of homes had um, a house cow and it would be the woman's job uh, to milk the cow twice a day. I, I think this is a fabulous photo. I can't believe this woman is just squatting like that to milk the cow because there's not even a little stool for her to sit on. Um, they had vegetable gardens. Now, the men may have done the heavy digging and put up the fence, but the women were the ones who um, kept the weeds out, would um, monitor the crop, pick the crop. Um, I remember my grandmother, her, the backyard had vegetables in it and had fruit trees in it. It had a chicken shed in it. And this was in the 1960s. So it wasn't just farming communities that had those facilities. Now, knitting and sewing were an important part of a, a woman's life. They were a necessity for them to repair the clothes. Um, buying clothes was not like it is today. Um, you would go off to the local tailor to have something made. Um, you would make it yourself. You would uh, repurpose things. You would, uh, if a shirt wore the collar out, you'd take the collar off and put a new collar on. Um, there was no um, electric uh, sewing machines. It was by hand, by hand, either by needle and thread or by an early sewing machine where you had to wind it. That was before the days of the treadle singer sewing machines. Initially, it was a, a job that you had to do to keep your house um, dressed, warm, um, keep them comfortable. And then it became uh, a pleasant occupation. But they were doing this by candlelight, by kerosene light. It wouldn't have been particularly good light that they were doing. Only you would do in the evenings after all the rest of your chores had finished. But it then became a pleasure and a hobby in later generations. It was something that they could exhibit at a show to show their skills. Um, and it was also in today's world, a way of teaching children how to be resourceful and reuse something, how to patch a pair of jeans rather than um, throw them out. Uh, so all those skills that were a woman's skill in a home um, have passed through the generations. And, um, you have to admire them for that. So with the agricultural shows, um, one, it was predominantly for the men to show off their, their produce and their cattle and sheep. The agricultural shows from the very early days had a pavilion for the ladies where they would um, show their cakes and their, their bread and their um, conserves and jams that they've made. Later on, they started to show their um, skills with their craft work, whether it was needlework or woodwork. The ladies would do um, all sorts of craft things. Um, they were practical things that they would use in the home, um, but they would exhibit them at the show. And a lot of the um, judges for the women's events were women. Uh, and you can find the results in the local newspapers. And of course, with the Royal Melbourne show, they'd be in the major city newspapers as well. So electricity was the big thing that changed women's lives. Um, 1900s was when electricity came to Melbourne. Initially, it was set up by independent companies and uh, it would be advertised in the papers. And I guess if you're out in Cranbourne and you got the paper and it says 1903 Bendigo, I've got power, you'd be wait, when's our turn? Uh, 1910 Ballarat had power. And uh, these were small local companies selling the power just in their areas. It was some time before we got um, the government sponsored big organization of the State Electricity Commission. And it was slowly moving out into the community. Um, mainly people who had the funds, business people firstly, councils putting street lighting in, and then it was getting into the private homes. Um, and it brought about a big change in the communities. Electricity for Cranbourne was 1928. Um, 
and it was it was initially um, the Kui Rup Electric Light Power Company applying to install street lights in Cranmer. Um, and then the following year, the Shire they held a um, public um, meetings to see whether or not the proposal and the offers was going to be acceptable. So in 1928, one of the first um, places to have electricity was um, one of the local garages where um, he was advertising that he now had um, electricity and he had this new equipment and his um, business went on in leaps and bounds. And of course, electricity changed um, women's lives because it made the homes safer to start with. Um, bearing in mind that a large percentage of these houses are wooden, their kitchens would be at the side of the house or quite often separate to the house to help with um, the fact there were open fires. Um, you read in the paper all the time of young children and women being burnt and scalded in um, fire accidents in the home. Um, 1921, before the electricity came to Cranbourne, we did a story about Eliza Robbins at Cranbourne, who's lost her life when a candle she was carrying um, lit, set fire to her blouse. Um, and you think the electricity may not have been terrific as far as the amount of light it gave out, but it was certainly going to make houses safer. It also made the houses healthier. They went from having a ice chest, um, which had only limited capacity to keep meat and milk fresh, to an early fridge. Now those early fridges um, were extremely expensive and the, most people had an ice chest even into the, eight, into the 1950s. They still would have ice chests in houses because Fridge was a very expensive commodity. And of course, with the advent of electricity, advertising had a new way of making men feel guilty for not looking after their wives. I loved this um, ad. It was a full page ad in the paper. It was around December and um, the whole premise was if you loved your wife and if you had done the housework, you would buy her an electrical appliance for Christmas. Now, bearing in mind at this time, if you were a pensioner, you were only getting 10 shillings. Something as basic as a toaster was costing 30 shillings. That's a lot of money for a toaster but the advertising was for the little woman, she would now be able to cook toast at the table and rather than have her toast after the family had been fed and left. And the whole premise of each little story here is um, for the man to go out and buy these electrical pro products to help care for his wife because she's the one who does all the housework. I found it interesting there was even a bed lamp for her to um, read at night, but I can't imagine anybody in that era lying in bed reading. Um, you went from having your toast made over the fire to, uh, to this early toaster, and, and a lot of us would remember toasters that look like that, um, which was sitting on your bench or your, or, or as I said, on the table, so you could make toast with the family. Um, all those appliances certainly did make the woman's life a little bit easier. She still had to do the work, but she had a little bit of help. And of course, in the laundry, um, it made a difference in the laundry. It reduced the number of hours they would spend there. Uh, at one stage, I read an article that it took four days to do the washing because um, on Monday, you would soak it. On Tuesday, you'd wash it. On Wednesday, it would hang out. On Thursday, you would iron it. and the, on and on and on. Um, this um, ki kitchen laundry here, there's a, a stove and there's the cooking things. They've got a, a washing machine. They've got a kitchen, the electric light now, and she's got her line to hang things up inside. And of course, we would all remember um, in our era, the Hills Hoist, or before that, the long um, 
rope with your piece of wood to hold it up from falling on the ground. And it was in renewable energy dried by the sun and the wind way before that became a popular thing to put in the newspapers. Um, all those things were helping a woman in her day-to-day -day housekeeping. And then Coles, when Coles Emporium opened up, I found a number of photographs of the things they sold. And I thought it was really lovely that front and center in this photograph is a, a sign one shilling and 11 pence for a knee pillow to help when you're scrubbing your floors. And I thought, I love that. Um, I'm sure most of those women were perfectly capable of making their own knee, bill, knee pillow, but if they weren't, they could go to Coles and buy one for a shilling and 11 pence. And then of course, social life was important to women. Um, they had um, many opportunities. There would be the church balls, there was card knives, um, debutante balls. This is the first debutante ball in Cranbourne in 1946. Uh, only thing is it didn't name any of those young ladies, but it was nice that their photo was in there and there was a report on um, the evening and, and uh, who they were presented to. So you can find lots about the women's social life in the newspapers and magazines. Um, there were women's magazines from the 1930s onwards. Um, they would have um, social information about who was going on holidays, who was returning from holidays, um, family who were visiting you from interstate or up the country, um, snippets about um, evenings with music, um, who was playing the piano at a wedding, all those bits and pieces enlarged the life of your lady and what she was doing. And women kept fit and they kept active. In between everything else they were doing, they found time to participate in sport uh, to some degree. Um, at the turn of the century in the 1900s, these are two ladies who are actually in a sculling competition on the Yarra River. Um, and they're fully dressed and I hope they didn't fall into the water because I couldn't imagine trying to swim with all that clothing on. Um, Many women were excellent equestrians um, and it wasn't just the upper middle classes. A lot of the ladies who worked on farms, they could handle horses every bit as well as the men could. Swimming was a healthy occupation, but again, they had these um, interesting neck to knee type swimsuits to keep them modest. Um, I don't know that you'd go swimming with your hat on, but I guess maybe they were being sun aware before it was popular. And of course, tennis uh, was a big thing for the ladies. And they got involved with their tennis clubs and their golf clubs and netball and lawn bowls, all these occupations. Um, from a very early day, there were competitions. The women quite often became the secretaries for these clubs. They did fundraising again, making cakes and selling them. Um, and that continues today with the number of women who um, work for the local football club or cricket club. And you can find their names on boards as being life members um, with those organisations. So you can find many other places that women worked um, where there's information about them temperance unions and uh, electoral lobbies, the women's patriotic guilds and the young women's Christian associations, the housewives union, all these places have websites these days. Um, they have photographs you can find. So this patriotic guild for, um, was in Dungog, the photograph is from the Australian War Memorial. And um, those women, apart from having a, a uniform uh, to, distinguish them and, and what they were doing. Um, they ran them in a business-like sense to raise funds. Um, the Women's Christian Temperance Union, they would march behind their banner. Uh, as it says, it was organized in 1882. Um, all these places have um, connections to women of 
all classes, whether they were the people receiving um, the charity, the people doing the fundraising. It was a way for women to connect with one another, to share ideas, and to also take their viewpoint to the men of the time. Um, places such as Rotary and um, Probus and the Lions Club, predominantly male organisations, but the women were involved. The women um, had women's groups. Uh, if you look at the history of Rotary, you'll quite often find photographs of the women with their husbands at functions and mention of the women um, in them. So don't sort of discount those places when you're researching. Um, so you're enlarging the story. You're um, asking places, asking people about places and the context of where they lived. Um, what was relevant in their local area was there, you know, if they were living on the swamp, did they have to go back towards Warrigal because in winter they couldn't get towards Cranbourne where they lived? Those things are relevant to what's happening in their lives. Um, the history of the time and the social customs of the time are relevant because you then can understand um, more about why these women uh, were so passionate about being in a church group or helping out a school. It was their um, connection to other people when so often they would be on a farm or not necessarily on a farm. You look at how isolated communities in the hills would be. Um, you might be on a property and maybe two mile walk away from the nearest other woman. Um, those things are part and parcel of establishing what that lady's life was like. Um, you should go hunting for every possible place you can think of where there'd be information. Um, use every search engine you can think of, go to visit websites, think laterally, look at the men to see if what you can find out about the woman, uh, look at children to see what you find out about their mother. Um, all those things bring little snippets of information to you when you're searching. And Always try and find original records. Technology in some ways is a two-edged sword. You've got online indexes, which are great, but they have mistakes in them. Um, and there's a great saying that that which is visible and easy to access hides much. So go looking for mistakes, go looking for, is there a question? How did this happen? Why did this happen? Trove is a fabulous resource, but we all know that the reader can sometimes throw up things and not find things. So Mrs. E. Pittard um, was missing in an item because the reader had her as Mr. F. Pitloud, so it didn't pick it up in the search. So you've got to think of all those things when you're searching. So I had a lovely time. Um, I went hunting. Um, I created files. Um, I found things I wasn't expecting to find. Um, I didn't find things I was looking for because they weren't available when I was looking. The photographs that I've used, some of them are family photographs, but the others have come from the State Library and the museum where there are photographs online that are out of copyright and you're allowed to access them um, for home use. Uh, the photograph for Sister Peck. Um, I found that website very interesting. It's a website for through the Australian National University and it's got hundreds and hundreds of biographies and photographs there and uh, a lot of them are women, which was really, really exciting. So women did live and work under assumed names. That's one thing I found out. They wanted to hide their identity for many reasons. They might have been involved in crime. There might have been a family scandal. They could have been a convict. Um, they could have been bigamy or illegitimacy. There were lots of reasons why women hid their identity. And you also have to be prepared to not find the answer to a question and accept that what you're looking for is just not available today. Doesn't mean it won't become available, but it's just not available today. 
You have to be aware that sometimes you'll find something you didn't expect or that you like, and it can be difficult, but you have to remember it's not your story, it's an ancestor's story, and times were different then, and it's your choice how you tell that story and what you tell, but it will be a fabulous journey and you will enjoy every moment and have the odd cry along the way. Thank you.